Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you. What a beautiful Wednesday it is today. It's nice to see the uh, temperature back on the positive side. And I, I hope that our time together in person and virtually will also be positive and, and warm our spirits. We are, this is our second um, Wednesday in our Lenten worship series. Um, today we are, are going to, to focus on, on uh, a passage in Mark that uh, is not part of our lectionary readings, but a good passage for Lent nonetheless. I jokingly uh, said, or I said to the, those worshiping with us, that this is actually coming out from the vault. It's a, a service that was never delivered during the ecumenical uh, Lenten services that we have here in Woodstock that was planned a few years ago. We had a, uh, a snowstorm, it started in Fredericton, so I couldn't drive up to deliver the message, and, and Helen Marsden was going to deliver it, but by the time the, uh, uh, the, the morning progressed, it wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, safe for people to gather, so um, I thought I would bring this uh, message today, since it, I think it fits well with um, with uh, Kindness Day, today's anti-bullying day, and the theme is here is uh, kindness is contagious. So our message might inspire us to, to think about kindness a little bit more. Our gathering words are taken from Isaiah 43, verses 19 to 21. Let us worship God who has done great things. We rejoice in our God who made a way through the desert of this world. Let us worship God, who has caused streams of mercy to flow in the wasteland. We are the people God has formed through Christ. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. All-knowing and all-caring God, we gather this day filled with hopes, filled with questions, filled with wonders, filled with the desire to know you and understand your word. But we also gather drained by the demands on our lives. This Lenten season, we're reminded that in many ways, we are like a parched desert, empty and in need of spiritual replenishment. As we gather together in person and virtually, we pray that you would visit us with your presence, that you would saturate us with your spirit, and that you would bathe us in your streams of living water, that our lives might acknowledge and worship you to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> the psalmist in the 91st Psalm assures us that those who love me I will deliver, says the Lord. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them and show them my salvation. Friends, receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of our Lord be with each of you this day. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 13 to 29. They cast out many demons, and they anointed with oil many who were sick, and they cured them. King Herod heard of this, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work within him. But others said, it is Elijah. When others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John the Baptist. They bound him and they put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias 
had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she couldn't, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man, and he protected him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, well, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he didn't want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and him beheaded in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before we began this, and I probably should have mentioned this at the beginning of the service, that please feel free to grab a glass of water. I passed out a glass of water to those here with us in person. But don't drink the water. Right now, I want you to pick it up, and I want you to hold it. And don't put it down until I've told you to put it down. No drinking, just holding. Well, what a terrible passage. This is certainly not an uplifting passage, but it is part of our biblical history, part of the Bible. It's tempting, of course, to skip over this passage. Certainly, it would have been easier and more uplifting to focus on the story of the fishes and loaves that follows. But on the other hand, it's stories like this that remind us why we need a gospel to begin with. But the passage also challenges us to think about our decision-making habits in light of this story. The choices that we make, who do they benefit? What shapes our decisions? Who influences us? How do they contribute? How do our choices contribute to God's transformation of the world? Now we know from reading this passage from Mark that Herodias and Herod made bad decisions, choices that benefited themselves. Mark gives us a little bit of insight into what shaped their choices, their thinking. Herodias has a grudge against John the Baptist because they were called out for their adultery. She and Herod. Alcohol could have also been a factor in that decision-making process. After all, there was a big birthday celebration. Possible judgment may have also been compromised by liquor. Mark also tells us that the mother put the idea to kill John into her head. But what about King Herod? What influenced King Herod's choice to honor that request? Well, Mark tells us that Herod was actually grieved by this request. But Herod also feared public embarrassment and being seen as a weakling or a failure if he didn't give in. Author Flannery O'Connor once said, there is a moment in every story in which the presence of grace can be felt as it waits to be accepted or rejected, even though the reader may not recognize the moment. There's a moment in, which, in every story in which the presence of grace can be felt as it waits to be accepted or rejected, even though the reader may not recognize this moment. What might have been different for Herod and Herodias had they chosen to be shaped by grace when faced with an opportunity to make a decision. Well, obviously John the Baptist would have lived. Herod's ego might have been bruised, but he wouldn't have had blood in his hands. He would have had more opportunity to converse with John the Baptist, which 
Mark tells us he enjoyed. He would have had more opportunity to gain understanding about who he was. And perhaps they may have, Herod and Herodias may have been inspired to end their adultery. Our Lenten journey invites us to pick up our cross. And picking up our cross comes in different forms. One of the ways that we pick up our cross is by thinking about the words and actions that flow from the choices that we make. We have the power to do good, but our words and our actions can also hurt others. They can lead to sin. Trusting in the life-giving power and the way of Christ invites grace to redeem or transform. We know that Christ's death and resurrection has broken the cycle, power of death and sin and evil and destruction. So what do we do with this hope, this reality, when it comes to making choices? Do we accept or do we reject the presence of grace within them? Here's a story I want to share. The author is unknown. Individual tells me about his friend who had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. One day, this friend, we'll call him Dave, Dave went to the store to buy his daughter a gift, birthday gift. He parked in front of the store, he got out, and he walked into the store. As Dave entered, the sales associate noticed his shuffling, and now he had difficulty maneuvering around the various displays. Occasionally, he would lose his balance. When he went to pay for his purchase, she observed the difficulty that he had getting his wallet and counting out bills. As she saw him return to the car, she decided to call 911. It wasn't safe, she thought, for someone to be driving under the influence. As the man drove home, he was pulled over by the police. Very quickly, the misunderstanding was cleared up as Dave explained, he had Parkinson's. Once the police pulled away, the man decided to return to the store to speak with the sales associate. What do you think he did when he arrived? Of course, it would make sense to assume that he would have been enraged to be falsely accused in that way. We could empathize if the man had been irate and told her off or filed a complaint with her supervisor. But you know what he did? He thanked her. He explained to her that he had Parkinson's and he described to her what it meant to have Parkinson's. She felt guilty for misunderstanding his circumstances, but he graciously told her, don't worry. Instead, he expressed his gratitude that a complete stranger would care enough about his well-being to take steps to make sure he was safe. He chose the side of grace. What possibilities can be experienced when grace permeates our choices, our words, and our actions? And these possibilities exist because the kingdom of God has come in Christ our Lord kingdom that is geared towards, that is made and geared towards love, peace, joy, hope, forgiveness, and wholeness. You know, circumstances may not always be of our choosing, and sometimes other powers or factors may influence or test us, and it could be the smallest things that lead to our unraveling. It could be fatigue, could be stressors, could be not enough sleep that night, could be other experiences or hurts. There are things that shape our reactions, but God has the power to work through such circumstances. God can help us work through those stressors and influences that may be affecting us in unhealthy ways. And God gives us the grace to begin anew, even when we make mistakes and choose the wrong thing. No matter what tests us or faces us, we have a choice to respond faithfully, for God's Spirit is with us, 
advocating for us, comforting us, guiding us, teaching us. We know that if we come before God's throne of grace, God will forgive us and enable us to start again. Our God is a creating, redeeming, and sustaining God. Sin's not meant to have the last word. I'm reminded of Paul in his letter to the Philippians when he writes from prison, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now by now, I can see that a few people have uh, you know, shaking their wrists and and, and uh, switch their glasses. You may have noticed that I have moved my glass from hand to hand. It feels heavier as you hold that glass. And whether your glass is full of water or even a bit, the longer you hold it, the heavier and more uncomfortable it gets. A psychologist once did this experiment with her class. She wanted the students to understand that stresses and worries are like that glass of water. Does it matter if it's eight ounces or 20 ounces? Keep holding that glass and thinking about your stressors and, and, and worries for a while and nothing happens. Think about them a bit longer and it begins to hurt. And if you think about your worries, you hold on to your burdens or you hold your grudges or you or, or you hold to your fears, eventually they'll hold you captive. Put your burdens down. Or as I was saying, last night in our Tuesday evening reflection, offer them up to God so that they can be transformed by his healing grace. Or give Jesus the yoke that burdens you and take his yoke for it is easier and life-giving, and he will give us rest, renewal of spirit. Our story doesn't have to be like that of Herod and Herodias. We are part of a bigger story, part of God's story. We're woven into a history of grace, of steadfast grace that won't let us go. No, how many, no matter how many times we get it wrong, the story that leads to God coming in the flesh to get into the muddiness of, his, of our lives, the story that sees his son give his life for our sake. And as we enter into that story of redeeming love, we're called to write stories of grace remembering day by day that Jesus authors our faith. The offerings of our lives to God are met with his creative, transforming, redeeming graces. As I said, whatever sin you confess will be met with grace and mercy. Whatever doubt you express will be met by the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Whatever talent you offer up will be met with spiritual renewing the mind. For worship and service and now you can put your you can put your glasses down as we offer up our, our our lives to the one who by the power at work within us who who is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen We can offer up our worries, our burdens, our hopes, our doubts, our sins, our brokenness to God who always hears us and who will give us what we need. So let us turn our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. Gracious God, in you we place our hope. You feed the hungry and you satisfy those who are thirsting. You befriend the lonely and you comfort those who are in despair. You lift up those who are low in spirit. Your power humbles us when we are proud. Your courage strengthens us when we are afraid. 
and your peace calms us when we are shaken. We have no needs that you cannot meet. We pray, Lord, for this world as it continues to fight against this pandemic. We pray that you would continue to tend to those who are suffering, those who are sick in body, mind, or heart, those who are recovering from surgeries, those who are awaiting appointments with specialists and awaiting procedures and surgeries. We pray that you would lift up and tend to those who are grieving and feeling alone. Guard those, Lord, who are living in fear and those who are weighed down by stress or worry. Grant opportunity to those who feel they are in a rut, those who need a second chance or a new beginning. We pray for your church here in this province and throughout the world. Help us to bear witness to Christ in all that we say and do. Help us to fulfill your work and walk in your ways. Lord, we lift up to you the nations of the world, especially those burdened by poverty, war, or oppression. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they would be inspired by your vision and will, and that they would work for the common good of all people. On this day, we also lift up to you those who are bullied and those who are bullies. May kindness nurture relationships, not actions or words that leave mental and physical wounds. Lord, bring about healing where there is bullying. Bring about healing behind the words, the actions, and other circumstances that lead individuals to bully. Lord, may we approach our relationships in hope, not fear. May we be welcoming and compassionate to all. Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us to work for healing in this world. Inspire us to build with you the kingdom of love and grace in which none will cause suffering to others and all will be caring, loving children of yours. Our compassionate, all-embracing God, ever-present, ever-loving, never-failing. Through Christ Jesus, we pray these things, and with him we continue to pray as he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today, as I mentioned, as you know, it is Pink Shirt Day, Anti-Bullying Day, and the theme is Kindness is Contagious. So my charge is this, that in Christ we have been given the power to plant seeds of hope and goodness. As Michael Curry wrote, our task is to take our best step and to leave the rest to God, to bear witness, even if the results of this witness aren't ours to know. We plant the seeds of hope and goodness that will one day grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. So as we go back to work, back to our daily activities, maybe back to curling, may the grace of God be with you May the love of Christ embrace you and the Holy Spirit keep you now and forevermore. Amen.